So I want to talk to you about education and the title of my sermon is Driven by Destiny. Nelson Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And Henry Ford said that anyone who stops learning is old, whether at 20 or 80, but anyone who keeps learning stays young. And I was wondering, you know, why, what does it mean to be young, to be old in that sense, and how his education relates to that. And, but I believe that the young are naturally curious, aren't they? I love it when the kids get to that age where they start asking, why? You know, Grandpa, why is that bug over there not moving? Well, honey, you know, it's dead. And it's, why? Why is this happening? Why? And they, kids want to observe, they want to learn, they want to explore. And I do, I love doing that with my kids when they were little. And they, we lived on the mission field, and so there was a lot of opportunities for them to ask questions. And we loved the outdoors. We would go in the banana plantations and run through there with our dogs and jump in the rivers. And they'd ride in the back of a pickup truck. And, I mean, it was like... 100 years ago here, you know, just a lot of freedom. And now I love doing that with my grandkids. Can't throw them on the back of a pickup truck here, you know. <laughs> they got to sit in their car seats and all of that. But then we get to the park and we get to playing. And yeah, I love playing with them and playing their games and jumping on a trampoline. Or But somebody who is old... Maybe not physically, they don't enjoy any of those things anymore. They don't want to go out. They don't want to. They already know everything. They're not happy with anything. They're not amused. You know, and so that's what I think of old and, and young. And I said, well, I want to stay young. In order to do that, Henry Ford said we need to continue to learn. And part of that learning is realizing that we know so little. You know, I, I get a degree here, and I realize, man, I so much more to learn. We need to continue learning so that we can be better, so that we can be a better influence and do more for the Lord. And there's a satisfaction, there is a joy in accomplishing something that you desire to do, especially if it's not an easy thing to do. So what is an education? According to the UNESCO Educational Scientific and cultural organization of the United Nations, I, I looked at different definitions of education, and that, this was, to me, probably the best one. The transmission of knowledge, skills, and character traits. Transmission of knowledge, skills, and character traits. I was thinking about the Jewish people, how that they have trades, most families have some type of train. I was in North Carolina, um, no, rather uh, Tennessee, this past week for the graduation. And my wife and I went and visited two days in Chattanooga where the Cherokee Nation was, used to be, and found out more about the Native American tribes that lived there by the Tennessee River, beautiful river. And I found out that the Cherokee had five different groups within each tribe. They had one who, a group that would be either considered like the medicine man or their priests. They had warriors. They had teachers. They had uh, people that worked the land. And the fifth one, laborers. So... You were either one of those, you had to be in one of those trades. As, and you would be born into that family and that's what you learned. And then you were supposed to marry somebody from a different trade within the tribe. So if, if, if your girl, your daughter was uh, from a farmer, she had to marry somebody who was not a farmer. And they were very smart because this way their children would, lay, would learn all the different trades you know, from mom and dad, they would learn different things, and that's, that's what they would do. And the Jewish people do the same thing. 
by the age of 13, young, young men are considered adults. They can marry. You know, they already have a trade. They already know what they are going to do. Knowledge has been transmitted to them. Skilled and also character traits are important. Now, in my opinion, you can have a lot of knowledge and you can be very skillful and still fail in life because your character traits are deficient or lacking. In my opinion, character traits, positive character traits are more important than how talented you are or how much you know. Prisons are filled today with very smart people. Very skilled people today have failed in their relationships. So character should be the first thing, character traits. At least that's what I try to impart to my children growing up. I felt like character was more important than anything else. But of course, a complete education will include the knowledge, will include the development of their skills. Interestingly, in 2021, the state of Texas passed a law stating that the, the Texas State Board of Education will integrate positive character traits and personal skills into the essential knowledge and skills adopted for kindergarten through grade trade to, to grade 12, sorry, as appropriate. And they list these character traits, which I'm going to read to you. The first one is courage. Young people graduating, you're going to need courage because you're going into an unknown new world, new decisions, things that you don't know perhaps ha what to do, what to do next. Some don't want to continue school. Some don't, want to do, don't know what to do for work. And so you're going to need that character of courage to face the future, to seek the Lord for what is the next step. Then it lists trustworthiness, including honesty, reliability, punctuality, and loyalty. Those are a lot of good character traits, wouldn't you say? The list, the list continues with integrity, respect, and courtesy. Responsibility, including accountability, diligence, perseverance, self-management skills, and self-control. Wow. it's a lot there. Fairness, including justice and freedom from prejudice. Self-management skills stands out to me. Learning how to deal with your emotions in an appropriate way. It's a lot of good character traits to me. This is, these, these are being Christ-like. I believe they got these right out of the Bible. Now there are two types of education. Formal, in which a teacher, an educator, transmits knowledge and works with a student in the formation of the character and development of their skills. That's formal education. Informal, it's a lifelong process in which each of us acquires attitudes, values, skills, knowledge from the influences and resources in our environment and from daily experience. Now, God's Word tells us in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. Which way should he go? Teaching him to seek God's wisdom and will for his abilities and talents. And even when he's old, he will not depart from it. So graduates and everybody else that's here, God's word tells us that we need to seek his wisdom. And we need to seek his will in the employment of our abilities, in our skills, in what we're going to do in life. When I was a young person, 
I was very blessed to know Christ at the age of 16. I was very blessed to have teachers from the Word of God that taught me that I needed to surrender my life completely to Christ and trust Him. And that takes faith. To trust God with your future. To trust God with what you're going to do. To say, God, lead me. What do I do? Whom should I marry? Lord, please lead me. Guide me. Direct me. And for years I didn't date. And I was willing to stay single. Unless I found a mate that understood my life track. My love for Jesus and the fact that I would serve God. When I met my wife, I told her, listen, I'm not going to waste your time. I serve the Lord. I love God. I'm sold out to God. Whatever he says I'm going to do, if he tells me to be a missionary one day, that's what I'm going to do. And we, he did say that. And she says, well, that's what I've been praying for. That's what I want to do. I want to be in ministry, so let's get married. That was 38 years ago. <laughs> Then four kids later and ten grandkids later and... Many churches that we have planted later by the grace of God. Here we are. I said, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Now, education has many benefits. Such as finding a fulfilling job. Many people say, I hate my job. And I said, well, what, do you, what would you love to do? Well, I would, I would love to paint, you know, something and make a living out of it. Or some parents dream of their kids being, they're so good at sports that they're going to be in the professional sports, you know. They're dreaming, but is that what God wants you to do? You got to find what God wants you to do and then go for that. I found out in my life I wanted to be a pastor and to be in ministry and that's what I did but I couldn't get paid for it so I had to work and then we God told us to plant the church and we planted the church but I worked two and three odd jobs I would drive a truck I would do construction and what else did I do at that time yeah So I would do these things to try to do the church. And one day we planted a church and the church grew. And then it was amazing when I was hired full time by the church. I was like, whoa, praise God. Then we planted another church. And then God said, go to the mission field. So we went. And I didn't qualify to go as a missionary from the church of God because I hadn't finished Bible school. And they said, well, we, we can't give you funding because you don't, you know, you would have to go through our educational process first and then go. And I said, well, God told me to go. And, and then they said, go teach Bible school in Santo Domingo because I told them I'm going to go to the Dominican Republic. God told me to go there. He says, well, we need a teacher in Santo Domingo. I said, well, God's telling me to go to the southern part of the island. That's where God called me. I said, well, go and go with the Lord and see what happens. I said, okay. So I went as an independent without a salary without support just from family, a few friends. So we had no salary, no insurance, didn't know anybody, but we went anyway. Sure, less than a year into it, I was ready to quit. I thought I made a mistake. But we will always come back. God told us to come, so he's got a purpose. He's going to do something. So we stayed 10 years straight. And we began to see what God was doing. And then we came back here for a few years, went back, came back in 2014. And now we have six churches over there. And we have uh, feeding centers going on. And now we have churches in other places too that God has helped us to start. And I'm like, whoa, I marvel. I marvel, but so whatever, if you want to be an artist, go ahead. 
if you're not good enough to be paid by it, well, go to school and work on the weekends and do another job until pursue your dream is what I'm saying. Pursue whatever God has told you to do. Start a business or build houses, be an engineer, whatever you want. You can be whatever you want to be. When my kids were little, also, I, I didn't want to be away from them at night, so I didn't go to school at night. I could have done it. When they grew up, that's when I went back to school. It's never too late. But God was faithful. We never went hungry. Even though we didn't have insurance or anything, we always had whatever. God healed us or had a good doctor that would help us out over there and whatever we need. One time my wife needed a surgery. And they were going to do it there. Somebody hurt here. And they, the, the St. Petersburg Hospital in Virginia said, come over here. You, my wife needed a hysterectomy. They did a hysterectomy for, free, for her for free. <laughs> and I figure out later, I told everybody, those people were the nicest people that we have ever seen in my life. They were like so kind to me, my family, my wife. I remember her before going into the operating room. She was shaking. With, it was so cold in there. They, they brought blankets that they had like in a little oven over there. I didn't even know that this existed. They had these warm blankets and put it over there. And I was like, why are they being so nice? Then I figured out that somebody told them, hey, these are missionaries. These people are living the boonies somewhere, you know, and they're sacrificing. And that's why they were so nice to us because we were, <laughs> and they, it was, it was, they didn't even cut her. They were in the Dominican. They didn't have that technology. We're going to open her all the way up, you know, and here they, got, isn't that wonderful? My wife is going like this, meaning. But I'm taking my time because it's the third service and we have more time. Is that okay? <laughs> I can tell you story after story after story after story of the faithfulness of God, of the miracles of God, of the goodness of God. Because you see, life is, is like a puzzle. My wife started doing puzzles with my grandkids. You know where the, you get the three, four pieces, like a little cow and a pig and a little farm, and you put them together with kids to teach kids. And then one day I saw her with a hundred-piece puzzle. And I'm like, this is not for the grandkids. She says, no, this is for me. I enjoy doing this thing. So I was like, okay, honey. You know, she put it there. Then another day I come home, and she's got a 500-piece puzzle. I'm like, 500? The last one was, what, a thousand? A thousand piece. We have a big table, and she takes it, and for days, you know, it starts living, filling up with little tiny pieces, little tiny pieces. And one time I, I came by, and I couldn't make sense of it, so I picked up the box, you know, that's got the picture of the puzzle. And I started looking at the box, and started looking at the little pieces. I see, saw this little yellow piece. And I was like, oh, that's a flower. And I... Found it, put it there. I was like, oh, wow. Then I wanted more little pieces. I found it. About 10, 15 minutes, I helped her. And then she says, don't you want to stay? I'm like, no, honey, that's okay. That's not my thing. You know, have fun. One day she finished it. I told her, don't take it apart. Put glue on it. Put plastic on it. Leave it. Don't, don't take it apart after so long. But our lives are like a puzzle. We have so many years on earth, and there's some, there are days, there are pieces of the puzzle sometimes that we don't understand what's going on. Lord, what's going on with this piece? <laughs> what on earth is going on? Lord, what are you doing, God? Why is this happening to me? There are pieces in our puzzle that we don't like to go through. But God says there's a purpose. There's a reason. And when you get older like me, when you get to be a grandfather like I am, you look at your puzzle, and my puzzle is almost all together, and it's so wonderful. And I looked at those pieces that I didn't want in my puzzle, and I say, now, Lord, thank you. Because he is working all things for good to those that love the Lord. 
There's a reason why those things are going on, and it's because God loves us. God knows what we need. God knows what he wants us to do with our lives. So there are many benefits to education. Everybody wants to have higher income so that they can enjoy a better life, have a home, have a car, have a vacation, have clothes, have everything that you need, provide for your family, good things. You can do that with a good education. A worthwhile dream requires as years of goals to be accomplished. And to reach a goal, obstacles have to be overcome. Right? Everybody would reach higher dreams if it was easy. But the bigger the dream, the higher it is to reach it. But you can reach it. You have to pray and say, Lord, what do you want to do with my life? And then start moving in the direction that you think God wants you to go. He will lead you. But you have to develop a plan with steps, goals that have to be met in order to do something. Education helps with that. It helps you to develop the ability to overcome obstacles, to think of ways through, to do things. In 1949, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote an article called The Purpose of Education. He wrote it in response to a very educated former governor of Georgia who was running again, died about a week before he was elected, and his theme was white supremacy. That was his theme. And so, in response, Martin Luther King wrote this article. I will read part of it to you. I quote, The function of education, therefore, is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. But education, which stops with efficiency, may prove the greatest menace to society. The most dangerous criminal may be the man gifted with reason, but with no morals. We must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. The complete education gives one not only power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. So Martin Luther King Jr. understood that you could be very filled with knowledge and skillful, but without morality, your education will always fall short. Without the knowledge of the truth of the word of God, your education will be incomplete. Jeremiah 1.5 reads, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. This scripture applies to you and me. Before you and I were formed in our mother's womb, the Lord knew us. Before we were born, he predestined us. He set us apart to do something for him. Every person on the face of the earth has a purpose from God to do something of value. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 31, don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. 
Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. We need to seek the kingdom of God first. Some people think that education is a fix-all. And the thing that will make you happy. Education, I've already stated, is great, is wonderful, is good. But an education that leaves out the word of God is not complete. In fact, it will lead you astray. Jesus tells you and promises that if we seek his kingdom first, live righteously, everything that we need will be given to us. And I stand here to tell you that not only will he give you what you need, he will surprise you with how wonderful the gifts of God are in your life. After salvation, the greatest gift that God has given me is sitting right there. My wife of 38 years. And one day, I held my little daughter for the first time, and I fell in love. And then another daughter, and then a son, and then another daughter. And then one day, I held my granddaughter, and then another one, and then another grandson, and then another one. There's 10. There's one on the way. It's going to be 11. <laughs> Each one of them an incredible gift. They look you with those little eyes. And they tell you, I love you, and they hug you, and you just... And then everything that I ever liked, God knows what you like. I like adventure, so he made me a missionary. I like hiking, so I hiked mountains. And I like swimming, and I like playing ball, and I like all these things. God just so blessed my life. I have families in so many countries people that I love and they love me and we just have a ball every time we get together. And the reason I love them is because they love God and they're doing God's work. The reason they love me is the same reason. We're in the same business. Souls. I can tell you guys, and I stand here at 63 years old, picture of health. I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's not about us. It's all about him and what he's doing in his kingdom. But when we give ourselves to him, then we get to live life with his life. And we get to know him and enjoy because God is a giver. He's so generous. We get to enjoy all the things that he gives us. Wherever we go, my wife always comes loaded with gifts for all the grandkids. She just loves to give them things. And they know, Grandma, what did you bring me? Oh, I got a surprise for you. Yeah, what is it, Grandma? She'll have candies or clothes or some kind of cool thing. I got a top for them the other day in Honduras. And, you know, tops usually you have to throw from the top with a string. But these tops somebody invented where you just, they, they, they have these two parts, and you just pull the string, and it just the top just does. So little kids, three years old, can do it. Oh man, that was that was the. And I only found them in Honduras too, because after we went somewhere else, it's like we want a top, because they play with it so much until they broke them. Good things. And the Lord just loves to give His kids good things. He loves to surprise you. Jesus is saying, don't worry about these things. Don't fear about providing for yourself, having, um, who am I going to marry? Where am I going to go? How's going to this happen if that doesn't happen? And people are trying to fill you with fear, and you got to do this. You can. 
Don't listen to that. Seek first the kingdom of God. His righteousness. All those things will be added. And then you won't have worry. Because when you trust the Lord, worry, fear, anxiety, they leave. They can't coexist with the love of God. They can't. But the people that live miserable are the ones that they want to rule their lives how they want to live their lives. They only want a piece of Jesus. They don't want all of Jesus. And they only give part of their hearts. They don't give the whole heart. So you can have no testimony unless you follow the Lord. No. He says, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. I'm not your Lord. I'm not your Savior. When we decided to seek his kingdom, first time we repented and got saved. The next day we had to make the same decision again. Every day we reinforce or deny the decision to follow Christ. That's why he said pick up your cross daily. And follow me. Now Paul said in Ephesians 2.8, God saved you. By his grace, when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. Who are you? God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. How many times have you been created? Two times. The first time you were created when you were born on this earth, you came out of Adam and Eve. The Bible says that we have been created anew. In Christ Jesus. When? When we believed. Nothing that we did. It's a gift from God. We have been created anew. God's masterpiece. For what? He created us to do good works, to do good things that he planned for us long ago. He preordained. He already knew before you were in your mother's womb. Oh, I know what I want Judy to do. And Judith, everything you do brings so much joy to the Lord. And Judy is so unique. And people don't like it when you're unique. They try to shoot you down. But we don't shoot her down here. We encourage her. Because we know she's a warrior for God. <laughs> Woo! Right? <laughs> and I can start naming names here. God preordained you to do good things for him. You say, well, what? Do everything for the glory of God. Your best preparation for tomorrow is to do the very best you can today. And love, the, love the people around you. Serve those that are next to you. And God will tell you where, what else to do. But you have to get moving. You have to do something. You have to sign up for a small group. Sign up to serve on a team. Do something for God. It's not menial. It's not small. Whatever you do for the Lord is very important. Very important. As I finish this morning, again, I want to congratulate those that uh, have achieved your degree, your diploma, continue to go on, continue to learn, continue to study. If an older guy like me can do it, you can do it. And study something you enjoy. One of my girls in the Spanish church is going for nursing. She tells me. Some people are like, oh, I can't poke people with ne needles. You know, well, what do you like? Computers? 
What do you like? Cooking? What do you, whatever you like, you can get really good at it and get an education on it and make a living doing that what you like. Then like somebody said, you find doing something that you like is not going to be work. You're going to be like, I can't believe I'm getting paid for doing this. This is so much fun. I have a nephew that gets paid for playing video games. <laughs> Isn't that something? You tell kids, don't play video games. Well, this kid is so good, they're paying him. But again, it's like the parents that think that their child is going to be a, a uh, professional player. It's like the chances are like lightning to hit twice a person for your child to become a professional. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing. It's better to say, whatever God wants you to do, follow that, honey. Don't tell your child you have to do this, you have to do that. Tell them whatever God tells you to do because you belong to God. As long as you love God, live to honor him. I will support whatever it is that you want to do because every child is different. Let's all stand to our feet. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> As we come to an end, I have to give an opportunity for people to get saved. If you have not received Jesus Christ, if you're not living this life of adventure, of following Christ, he's inviting you to follow him today. Is there anybody here that say, Uriel, I want to receive Christ? I've never done it. I've never trusted him. I have not done it publicly. If you want to do it today, I want you to raise your hand and say, I'm giving my life to Christ today. God spoke into my heart today, and, and this is the moment I need to give my life to him. Is there anybody here that would say that? Young lady? Wonderful. Anybody else? Anybody else wants to come to Christ? In a moment, I'm going to ask that young lady to be courageous. The first character trait that we read on that list and, and come meet me here in the front. Meet me and my wife. We're going to pray with you. And anybody else that wants Christ, I want you to come and meet me. We're going to pray with you. And then we're going to pray with anybody that needs health for their bodies or health for their minds. We want to pray for healing for you. We want to pray with you if you feel oppressed in any way. Because you know that's what it's being saved is. Some people say I'm going to get saved when I stop doing bad things. Then I'm going to come to church when I clean myself up. Salvation is not modifying your behavior. Salvation is being created anew. It's going to be a new you. How, pastor? Salvation is, first of all, liberation from death. Freedom from oppression. And the first oppression that needs broken off of our lives is our own sin. We're bound to our own sin. We can't change ourselves. We're bound to do the wrong thing. We're bound to break the laws of God because that's what we are. We are sinners. But Jesus makes us holy. He breaks the power of sin and he gives us the power to live righteous lives for him. Jesus does the changing. He does the cleansing. Every person is oppressed by the chains of sin. And then there are many other oppressions. Depression, anxiety. Bitterness, unforgiveness. Believing the lies that you were told that you would not amount to anything in your life. And you believe that lie that somebody close to you told you. Believe that you're nobody, that you can never do anything in life, that you've messed up. Those are lies of the devil. It's true that many have aborted their destiny. Like King Saul in the Bible, 40 years serving God, but he was a bad king because 
He was obsessed with himself and staying in power and he started killing the priest of God and trying to kill David, the next king, and he ended up killing his own sons and himself in battle. The enemy killed them, but it was his fault. He aborted his destiny because he was rebellious. Samson, judge in Israel, beautiful young man, should have lived to an old life with honor and dignity, died young because he ran after pleasure, sexual immorality. Couldn't control his vessel. He ended up with his eyes being gouged out by the enemy, dying young. He aborted, he thwarted his destiny. Let not that person be you today. And for anybody that may think, Pastor, I've messed up too much. I've messed up my destiny. No, you haven't. You know how I know? Because you're here. You're alive. You're not cut off from the earth. You're not dead. And while you have life, you have an opportunity to start over again. David himself messed up big time. He killed Uriah with the sword of the enemy. Took his wife. His baby died because of it. His sons got killed because of it later on in life. But David repented and came back to God and acknowledged his mistakes and he said, kind of cried out for mercy and God had mercy on him. He became the greatest king of Israel ever had, King David. So while there is breath in your lungs, you have a chance to start over again. You can say, Lord, forgive me. I'll repent. I'm done running after the lies of the devil. I'm going to run hard after God from this day forward. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to fall in love with him. I'm going to give him my whole heart, my whole life.